Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I've spent the last two plus decades of my life. I just left Beaumont, and I'm now in Atwater. When I got to Atwater, there was a couple of issues that I had to deal with because of the things I've done in another yard. When I was in Victorville, I stabbed up a Guamanian dude. Then when I was in Beaumont, I beat up a Cambodian dude. And for me, all those things that I've done were justified. Like I tell you, I'm not somebody that gets out there and try to cause unnecessary havoc for myself. But when an issue arises, or when I see something foul or something wrong, I'm gonna deal with it. And I've dealt with it every single time. And sometimes the avenues that I choose to deal with it, I don't know what, you know, how to explain it, but it's just, for us to feel is necessary because when conversations break down, the only language that people understand is violent. Violence is a universal language. It leaves no misunderstanding on how you feel about a certain situation, a certain topic. I tell people all the time that come in through the system that are my homies, don't ever put in your two cents when it's not asked for. If there's two guys having a disagreement and you pitch in and throw in your two cents, if the guy turns around and tell you, man, shut the fuck up, mind your business, what are you going to do? You're going to shut the fuck up and mind your business? Well, if you're going to shut the fuck up, then why do you open your mouth in the first place? I'm not here to tell you when and when not to insert yourself. But if you speak on something, if you take a side, if you have an opinion, then you need to understand that you got to stand with it. You got to stick with it, no matter where it takes it. So if I insert myself in a dispute, in an opinion, whatever, then I'm going to deal with whatever comes with that. If I hustle, you can't, everybody just can't hustle. You hustle, you give somebody some, and they don't pay you, what are you going to do? If you're not going to do anything, if you're not a person that can go collect, they don't hustle because all you're doing is going to get your shit took it. Mm -hmm. So all these, this is, you know, I've dipped and dab in every aspect in a penitentiary. Like I've done everything but mess with punks. I made wine. I distribute. I've made moves. I run a gambling table. I ran dice games, I ran football tickets. This is how I survived in the penitentiary because like I said, when I went there, I left the world behind. I have families and friends here, out here, but for me, I didn't want to be a burden on them. So outside of three meals and a bunk bed, everything else I want, I got to come up with the funds to get it. And to come up with the funds, you got to grind. I've been fortunate enough through the course of my time that I built relationships and rapport with individuals that have clout, that got connections, that were able to move things around, and I was able to be right there with them. But like I said, when I came to uh, Atwater, I had to deal with a couple issues. I think I told you in a prior episode that I was sat down with a Guamanian named Kenny. And I explained the situation why I stabbed up one of his friends. Cause you know, Guam is small. So everybody in Guam pretty much know each other. And everybody has an affiliation with their race. You know, if this dude moved on an Asian dude, some other Asians might feel some type of way about it. Whether it's Vietnamese, whether it's, whether it's Laos, whether it's Chinese, Korean, 
whatever you go down the list, Guamanians, Hawaiian Islanders, you know, everybody's got friends from everywhere and everybody knows each other. And if you're somebody's friend and somebody did something to one of your friend at another yard or whatever, and you run into that guy, you're going to feel like you want some get some get back. So me and Kenny sat down in the kitchen. I told him my story. And at the end of the day, Kenny's a man. And men respect men. And he understood that there was no other way for me to deal with that situation. If a guy runs into my cell with a knife and I let him make it and not do nothing to him, then the word's going to be out that anybody can run up in my cell with a knife. Even though the issue wasn't directly with me, I was disrespected. You're never supposed to be in a cell with, with a knife and you're never supposed to pull it out and you're never supposed to act like you were gonna lunge in and stab me, you know? He lunged in and act like he was gonna stab me thinking I was gonna flinch. So you have to deal with those situations, man. When somebody take your shit, you gotta deal with it. If you don't, you're gonna have a hard time in the penitentiary. The incident in Beaumont with a Cambodian guy, he had co-defendants over there too. So his co-defendant pulled me up and asked me what happened. And I told him, listen, the guy was Cambodian. I was trying to make a move on this Hawaiian dude named Kamanaka. I was pressing him. And I had a payment plan set up, amount of money, whatever set up. But I'm giving the guy respect, the Cambodian dude respect, by letting him know what I'm doing. Well, he turns around and tells that guy and a few other Asian dudes. So of course, I felt some type of way about that and I dealt with that situation. So I'm in Atwater and that Cambodian guy's co-defendant pulled me up and I explained the issue to him. And he was like, okay, now nah, we're good. All right, I just wanna know if you guys jumped in and this and that or whatnot. So I, we had the conversation and I thought the situation was settled. But we're all just exiting Beaumont. Buses are coming in from Beaumont, you know, every week. Cause they're just busting us out once a week. I was on the first bus out of there. So every week, son, he's the co-defendant code, of the Cambodian dude, son is Vietnamese. They were all in, uh, in there for murder robbery. Back in the 90s, you had, uh, maybe if you heard about it, they had the Chinese paying people to steal computer chips. So they were paying these Asian gangs out of California and the Crip gangs out of California to run up in uh, corporations and steal computer chips. And they had to get the computer chips from each computer. So these dudes would run up in there and lay down the whole floor and go in there with a bag and push the button and pull out the computer chip, each computer chip. So if there's a hundred computers in there, they're extracting the computer chip one by one, one by one. But the Chinese were paying them millions of dollars to do it. You know, there was a crip dude named uh, Elmat in Lompoc. Him and his crew, I don't know exactly what crip hood he's from, but him and his crew were doing 20 plus life sentences for the same thing. But I, how he got himself caught up was a Chinese dude approached him with a lick and was gonna pay him a million dollars to go and get the computer chips. He had all the play, he knew the place, he gave him all the laid out. All they had to do was go in there and get it. I mean, you go in, it is, it's robbery. You know, so they go in and they get the computer chips. They got whatever, how much they got computer chips. And the guy that contacted him was waiting for them with their million dollars. But one of his homeboy, one of L Mac's homeboy told L Mac, said, hey, man, we got another different dude that wants the computer chips, too. And he's going to pay us two million dollars. So they burned the first guy to go try to make a deal 
with the second guy for the two mil. But when they did that, the first guy that set him up with the lick got mad and called the police on them. And that's how they end up in freaking prison. You know? <clears throat> so back to Atwater, I'm coming out of the kitchen one day and uh, son go gets my homeboy T-Bone. He's from uh, MHS, but that's still his squad. His name is Day Ray. You know, in the feds, you get people from all over the country and all parts of the world in there. And I used to live in Modesto, California, which is just 30 minutes from Atwater. And I remember T-Bone back in the days when I was young at the park playing. And it was just surreal to run into him. You know, he was with me in Lompoc. But in 2001, Atwater opened up and they all got shipped out. So we were only in Lompoc together for a few months. So now this is 2008 and I run back into him. A lot of the homies that I was in Lompoc with was already in Atwater. So I was happy to come back to Atwater, back to the West Coast. I'm from the West Coast and I feel more comfortable. I mean, I'm able to do my time anywhere and every single penitentiary, but at the same time, you always wanna be in a place where you feel is like home. You know, Utah don't have a federal penitentiary. Idaho, Wyoming don't have one. You know, the closest that we get leaving here from Utah is either we go to California, that's Victorville, for, as far as USP is Victorville and Atwater, or Tucson, Arizona, or Florence, Colorado. But Tucson, Tucson, Arizona is considered a dropout yard. It's a yard for sex offenders, people that have been victims and raped or ex-gang members. So if you're a white boy and you catch a case, let's say you catch a pimping case, which is considered a sex crime, and you go to Tucson, Arizona, you got 24 hours. If you are... If you don't leave that yard within 24 hours, you can never go to another yard in the federal system as far as the USP is concerned because they, we all consider Tucson, Arizona, a dropout yard. So most white boys that go out to the, and when you go to that Tucson USP, before they let you out, they try to make you sign a paper that you're not gonna bust these uh, child molesters and rapists and sex offenders head. No one, re everybody refuse, and if you refuse to sign it, they won't let you out. But if you get let out for whatever reason, and you don't bust one of them sex offenders head, you better stay there in Tucson, Arizona, because of all the races in the penitentiary, the white boys, they don't play that shit. If your ass has been in Tucson, Arizona, Terre Haute, or Terre Haute, whatever you want to call it, that's another uh, yard that's considered a dropout yard. And then one of the Coleman's, there's a Coleman 1 and Coleman 2. One of them's a dropout yard. I don't know which one it is, so I don't want to say. Because when you come off the bus, you get a piece of paper that shows you where the last prison you was at. And if you're coming, if you're white, you know, if you're black, you know, I have a lot of good black friends. You know, I'm friends with everybody. You know, when I'm on the West Coast or whatever, I function everywhere I've been. I function real tough with the Crips and the Bloods. I have good DC homies, Vice Lord homies, GD's homie. You know, one of my good friends was named Trigger and Booby from Louisiana. You know, but, um, as far as the politics go for the blacks, they're not as stringent. You know, it's not a it's not it's not um a whole like a group because all the blacks get broke down into different gangs. West Coast, East Coast, Bloods, Crips, Folks, Vice Lords, P Stones, and all the rest. So everybody politics their own. But the white boys even though they have their own different gangs, 
you know, the AC, Aryan culture, Nazi lowriders, ABT, the brand, Dirty White Boys, and a dozen other sack, the ones out here from Utah. And then you got the independent, even though they're all broken up to different groups and different states and whatnot, their politics is the same. They're not letting you, they're not letting sex offenders walk. They're not letting rats walk. And they're not letting dudes come from them dropout yards walk. So if you have friends that are white, especially hip them to it. Because if they don't know the politics, they're gonna get chopped up. So back to my story with son. You know, bus is coming in, and every bus he come in, he's getting a kite from the Cambodian dude that I, that I beat up. And uh, so this last time, my homeboy T-Bone comes and hollers at me and says, hey, man, what happened over there in Beaumont with dude? And I explained T-Bone again. He brought me over there. You know, son went and grabbed him to come and talk to me. I said, man, I thought we already discussed this. I thought this shit was settled already. He said, yeah, you know, but I keep getting this kite and this. I said, all right, so I explained myself again. And again, we said on the issue. So I go in the kitchen to go eat. But while I'm eating, I'm kind of in my feelings. I'm brewing, you know, I'm brewing over the, the conversation we just had. So when I finished eating, I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to go deal with this where there leaves no misunderstanding. So I go back to the unit, grab my knife. I go tell my homeboy T-Bone. I say, hey, man, I'm gonna go holler at this Vietnamese dude. He said, all right. I grab my homeboy Chaos. He's from the hood. And he was the only one I ever been with that was from the hood out here with me out in Atwater. So we go across the yard to 6A. So I go to the door, like all the Hawaiians and Islanders, cause it's right after Chow. They're all hugging out in front of the unit. So I go in to the door and I ask one of them to go get a uh, son. So son goes in, so they go in and go get son. Son comes out with a couple of Vietnamese dude. So I pull son to the side, say, listen, man, I understand it's your co-defendant. And I understand that you might feel some type of way with what transpired in Beaumont. But let's figure this out right now, what you wanna do. You want to go in a cell and deal with this? Or you want to drop it and never bring it up again? It's on you. You know, he said, nah, that's between you two. And that was it. We did the conversation. And, you know, through the course of my time there, I got to know son. And we became friends. And he's a good dude. But in the penitentiary, you never really know. You have to build a, have the willingness to confront your, the situation head on. You don't want to leave anything to uncertainty. You never know what's going on in another person's head. And you have to do your best to get a clear understanding. But again, in the penitentiary, like I said, you know, some people might not like the way we, the things that we've done or how we handle shit. But amongst men, once they shake hands and agree on something, no matter how tough the issue was to, to work out, no matter if you have to swallow your pride or whatever it is, if you don't want to swallow your pride, if you don't want to let that shit go, then let's get it in. But if you decide, hey, we're going to move on, everything's cool, or whatever, and you shake hands, us in there as men, we respect that because that's our word. I can't tell you to your face, hey, we're good, we're cool. Then when you walk away, double back and hit you. Because if I do that, yeah, I might got off right there and then, and I might've won, I might've fucked you off, but now the word is out that, man, you can't trust Mesa. You can't trust anything that comes out of his mouth. 
He's going to tell you it's cool, and he's coming back, and he's going to backdoor you. Now, you're going to get a hit put on you by the one you pushed up on, and also, your homeboy's going to hit you because you didn't keep your word. If you don't want to let something go, go deal with it. But if you make agreement with somebody, if you shake somebody's hand, that's what it has to be. Like I said, you might not like the things that we do, the things that we've done, but we have standards. There's certain things we don't accept. There's certain things we don't tolerate. We don't violate kids. We don't violate women. And we don't tell on people. Welcome to the USP.